So another area that is uh, in some, er some sense doing better and some sense, let's see, is Latin America, where uh, we've seen extremely weak performance by the Brazilian economy, which has fallen into a deep recession, is now projected to finally come out, but not come out very strongly. Uh, Argentina has uh, had suffered as well. Uh, the commodity exporting countries of the, uh, of the West Coast, Peru and Chile, have been doing less well than in the, than in the, uh, the immediate past. But the poster child internationally, I think, for poor economic performance has been the absolutely disastrous performance of the Venezuelan economy in the context of the crisis that we all know. There's new news here the long, that I thought would be of interest to this group. Uh, we heard some uh, somewhat odd-sounding announcements by President Maduro of Venezuela about something about refinancing, restructuring, re-something the debt after having made a very large principal payment and with another large principal payment due next, is it next week? But luckily, uh, Elena Daly is here who is uh, very well versed in uh, what's happening there. And I thought it would be of interest to all of us to give us just a brief update on where things stand, where this is likely to go, uh, how long it's likely to, to work out, and all the details that I'm sure you can provide uh, ex expertly. Thanks, Elena. Well, thank you, John, and thank you for um, adding me to this distinguished panel. Um, as it, oh, sorry, now I have a Queen Elizabeth. Uh, uh, real quick Elizabeth moment. <laughs> so thank you, um, John, and um, members of the panel for um, inviting me to speak um, uh, today. Um, I'll just spend a few minutes um, giving you a, a quick, um, you know, maybe, you know, kind of a quick state of the union address uh, for uh, Latin America. <laughs> um, uh, nah, um, not a poster child, um, as uh, you once mentioned, um, John, that uh, you know what Venezuela does best of any of the countries is putting a wrong foot forward <laughs> um, at every given um, uh, turn. And it's certainly, you know, you're aware of, uh, you know, uh, long-lasting um, humanitarian, economic, um, political crisis um, in the country um, that's been going on for uh, for a while, uh, from the um, pre previous President Chavez and now and inherited by President Maduro, uh, Maduro who doesn't. Um, have much of wiggle room, but to continue um, you know, uh, corrupt and um, um, and uh, adverse uh, policies. So um, we had all this crisis, but you know, even two years, uh, two months, uh, two, <laughs> two years, um, two weeks ago um, in Washington, when discussed these matters at the IMF meetings, we were still um, wondering whether there will be um, a real debt crisis um, in uh, in Venezuela, because um, obviously the levels of um, debt uh, are very high. It's 140. Three billion um, total debt for the small country like Venezuela. It, it's enormous, um, but the payments um, had been um, have been uh, made. Um, so the balloon of um, a debt crisis and debt restructuring was not up two weeks ago. Um, everyone was expecting that um, <clears throat> uh, last. Um, Thursday, when um, an enormous, uh, um, substantial chunk of um, <clears throat> um, 842 million um, was due of pr a principal payment um, uh, by PDVSA, um, the uh, state company of, um, of uh, Venezuela, it will not be paid. Uh, it would not be paid. It was paid uh, with some um, trembles uh, over Friday whether the fiscal agent um, delivered those payments to, um, to the bondholders. It, it did happen. Uh, moreover, um, yesterday, President Maduro um, came up with uh, a decree, and that's um, the quote, um, decreeing uh, refinancing and restructuring of external debt of all Venezuela payments. 
um, it is, uh, you know, that the phrase could be um, analyzed uh, and will be analyzed, I'm sure, by, by reporters. Uh, but from a debt um, restructure perspective, um, I've been um, doing it for some time, um, <clears throat> especially in the region, uh, in Latin American region, um, it, it, it has all the signals um, um, of this debt restructuring um, being quite unique and unusual. Um, I guess that this time would be different um, and different from uh, um, from Argentina, um, uh, from um, other countries in the region, and different from Greece, um, obviously. Um, but you know that uh, uh, Argentina is on everyone's mind when um, one thinks about um, debt restructuring in um, Latin America. So, uh, to my um, view, that would not be your father's debt restructuring. Um, so, and um, why? Um, first of all, the debt stock um, is not only enormous, it's very diverse. Bonds represent uh, 52 billion out of 143 billion dollars. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, you know, the other uh, components are commercial paper, exit arbitration awards that already existed, um, promissory notes, um, and so forth. By, you know, by the debt composition, um, this reminds me only of, the, uh, of Iraq debt restructuring because it's very diverse um, and intricate. Um, also, and this is enormous, and why, why it would be uh, of um, enormous importance to the U.S. Um, um, because uh, Venezuela is a sovereign debtor with um, enormous commercial ties to the United States. Um, therefore, the risk of possible holdout creditors in the restructuring, and holdout creditors are the ones who don't voluntarily go into restructuring and hold out until such time as they can just uh, file a legal action. We remember uh, Argentina example and uh, um, a very difficult um, situation with the holdout creditors. It took years to unwind. Um, so. The, the risk of um, holdout creditors is therefore more acute um, in this situation because of that exposure to the U.S., because of the commercial ties um, to um, the U.S. Um, and um, so um, how long um, will it take? Um, well, in, in the military, there is this term, uh, there are two terms um, that I uh, once uh, um, read, um, uh, um, ROM and WAY AG. ROM uh, stands for um, rough order of magnitude, um, and WAY AG stands for wild um, guess. Um, so uh, <laughs> so I, I think um, if we, you take... Uh, together the, the debt uh, composition, the exposure to the U.S., the, the role of PIDVESA, the state-owned company, a commercial entity, um, the fact that there are OFAC sanctions uh, in place that would prevent creditors to even participate in the meeting um, that was called by Maduro for uh, November 13. Um, so all of that makes, uh, you know, uh, let me give you my wag, um, that it will take some time, <laughs> but it all depends uh, on many factors involved. Thank Bot you. Yeah, bottom line here is structurally this is going to be one of the most complex uh, uh, debt deals of all, uh, not least because a huge amount is owned, owed to uh, Russia and China in formats that are un uncertain. And the, uh, moreover, the sine qua non for uh, Venezuela, I, I would say, the good part is, I don't, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, there is, as opposed to EG in the 80s, or uh, uh, even some more recent cases, there are no financial institutions of consequence at risk from their holdings of Venezuelan debt. That, yeah, that, that, that's correct. At the same time, uh, it is possible, the sine qua non for the Venezuelans is to avoid legislation, or sorry, let litigation that would tie up their ability to export, for example, oil. And uh, so I think a question all around is, is that much of a risk? Because if it is, that could be disruptive to the 
to world energy markets, at least for, uh, for some time, couldn't it? That, that is absolutely correct. Um, um, and the role of, of China and Russia um, in, uh, in uh, Venezuelan debt and ex exposure of these two um, um, geopolitically important countries um, to debt of, of Venezuela um, and the ability to um, influence the, the flow of, of commodity in the country might just, and it's just, again, you know, the, I guess, might incentivize the countries to come to an aid to uh, Venezuela in, in that management um, situation. Um, and uh, Russia and China. Uh, China's exposure um, uh, is roughly between 18 and 20 billion um, of Venezuela, and but their interest in uh, the situation is actually um, the the flow, the the non-disrupted flow of commodities into China. So here I see, you know, an opportunity for, for them to. Um, um, to come to um, you know, some sort of a resolution um, outside courts. Um, and, and John, you're absolutely correct that the fear the, the, um, that drives uh, Maduro's government to be current on payments of principle um, is the fear of litigation. Um, uh, old sins uh, cast long shadows, and the, shad the, the shadow that Argentina debt restructuring cast on the region um, and beyond um, is still quite dark. Um, and there, the litigation was tied up up to 40% of uh, debt stock of uh, Argentina. It lasted for years and years. Um, there, is a, there is a solution, the collective action clause in the document, but it get, goes in a little bit technical. I can take those questions outside. So, complicated, super complicated, some dangers, uh, and uh, it's going to give, I'm sure, mainly a lot of lawyers a lot of work for years, perhaps years to come. So that's, that, depending on your point of view, could be, could be viewed as a positive. Okay. So thanks. I think th that that uh, sums up, uh, I think, our uh, uh, discussion on the on the economic outlook, with one issue of uh, exception that uh, I think some of us may want to comment on, and that is, if there has been a something that has uh, uh, perplexed economists, and uh, has been this seeming lack of relationship between labor markets, labor market conditions uh, that has been known by economists as the Phillips curve. The idea that there is some regularly understandable, uh, predictable relationship between levels of, in popular vernacular, uh, levels of unemployment and rates of inflation. And what has uh, perpetually, or the last few years, come as a surprise is especially in the, in the U.S., but not just in the U.S., also in Japan. Tightening of the labor market seems to be unrelated to, uh, uh, to developments in, uh, uh, in wages and therefore in broader inflation. I think, uh, Inara, you were uh, skeptical that, that's going to, that this current situation is, uh, is going to continue. Is that... Uh, uh, what, what is the, the basis of your skepticism that the current favorable trade-off is, uh, is, going to con is going to be sustained? Well, <clears throat> simply, if the unemployment rate in the U.S., for instance, were to come down to 3%, do you believe there will be no, there will be no inflation under such circumstances? If the unemployment rate of Japan were to come down as low as 1%, surely inflation would flare up. So there should be some inflection point. And as I said, in history in Japan, uh, it was below 3%, somewhere between 2 and 3. Whether um, inflection point appears in that range or uh, we'll have to wait until the unemployment rate drops below 2%, uh, well, it's questionable. Uh, but my, my guess is, um, as far as Japan is concerned, um, 
Mr. Abe is really anxious to pressures on both labor unions and uh, big companies to raise uh, you know, wages. Uh, in Japan, every spring, there'll be uh, big uh, negotiations between large labor unions and large companies, managements. And uh, uh, so um, Abe administration may use taxation on, for instance, retained earnings as a threat to large companies' management to accept large wage increases next spring. This is my, my pure um, you know, speculation, which may happen or may not happen. I don't know. But if I were Mr. Abe, I would do so to end, end deflation, deflationary psychology. So let's see. But in the... In Motoshige Ito is closer to Prime Minister, so uh, <laughs> he knows would something you, about it. Would you care to comment? I would just ask about this uh, labor market. Yes, if you look at just the aggregate data, such as unemployment rate or job offer... Job You're talking about uh, Japan, uh, Japanese job, data, yes. Yeah, if you just look at only aggregate data, yes, labor market is very tight. And we often, Japan, just look at the job offer, job seeker ratio. It's now 1.5, which is highest in the last 40 years. But if you look at the individual sector, some is only 0.3%, and some is 3 or 5. So there's very significant uh, discrepancy among the industry. So if labor can be very easily reallocated, well, there's no problem. But there seems to be very structural problem, maybe because of the technological change, or maybe because of just the other uh, factors. So I, I just would like to... You know, uh, this is other countries' uh, situation, whether just macro data is enough for us to look at just the relation between wage and uh, unemployment or very structural problem is now existing, which make it more difficult for the wages responding to the tight labor market. I wasn't expecting. Oh, I wasn't expecting to say anything along these lines. But I think this is not about the Phillips curve, by the way. This is about supply and demand. Um, if the demand for labor goes up, shouldn't the price go up? <clears throat> and I can pass along, um, having followed it a little bit, some of the American experience, which is along these lines. It's highly differentiated by region. So I was just a couple of weeks ago at the Boston Fed, and the session before mine had the five state economists reporting on the five states which are in the New England region that's res the responsibility of the Boston Fed. In each of the five states, with the exception of Maine, the principal economic problem is labor shortages. There are 400,000 jobs unfilled in Massachusetts as of today. Right? Um, at the same time, in Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, labor force participation rate has gone down 4% since 2008, which is an unprecedented fall in the labor force participation rate. So there are massive regional differences in the labor markets. So not only has social mobility declined in the U.S., but inter-regional mobility has declined. And there is some speculation that this is associated with the collapse in housing prices, because if you were living in Michigan or in Ohio and your house price declined by 50 percent, you can't move. You can sell your house for half of what it was worth Five, ten years ago, but you can't buy anything in a place that would have jobs that, would, that, you, uh, that you might take. So the American experience is that there are a substantial areas with ma massive labor shortages and other areas where labor force participation continues to decline. Although I would just add the, the uh, caveat, when folks say we have massive shortages, labor shortages, we have all these openings and can't fill them, and they, but they don't result in rate wage increases, makes you wonder, what do you mean by a, a shortage, right? It means you're, just, you're at a place that you're, you're away from the equilibrium on well, the... On you're the absolutely. Well, often, often it's about a skill mismatch, right? And, and, you know, when you don't have the skilled labor in the area, right, then the only way to overcome that, is you can't raise the wages of those who are already employed to fill a, an unfilled job. You have to bring in people from outside which used to be done through H-1B visas, and those have all been cut off. What do you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I just want to underscore uh, effectively the point about uh, structural change. So, uh, you know, the Phillips curve is this kind of short-term macroeconomic relationship. Uh, 
<clears throat> but more important in, in the last few decades is the structural change. So in the United States, uh, wages have been stagnant, uh, particularly m wages of uh, male workers, particular types, white male workers, have declined even as uh, uh, labor productivity, the aggregate number, has been uh, increasing very substantially. And so that has resulted in uh, a huge increase in the share of capital in GDP and, uh, and a share, a uh, falling share of labor in GDP, about an 8% swing over uh, something like 30 years. Um, so this, I think, is, uh, you know, so perhaps we shouldn't be surprised if you have these long-term trends that you're not getting the impact on wages that you would expect from a short-term relationship. And uh, uh, so what may be going on is that underlying, while, while kind of aggregate demand has picked up, uh, Underlying this is a technological shift and globalization shift, which is reducing the demand for unskilled workers um, in, uh, uh, and at the, at the margin, you know, these people need to work, okay? So they accept lower wages, right? So the adjustment is, is, is a kind of combination of a demand shift, but also a structural shift which is leading a lot of the workers to take jobs uh, which they couldn't get before during the crisis, but they're taking them at lower wages than, I w than they would have at the past, in the past. And at the same time, because of the same technological change, you have demand for skilled workers uh, that are not being fulfilled. And maybe it's temporary, but you, you will get the escalation of wages at the high end, but not necessarily will you see this at the aggregate level. So it's this kind of stuff that's going on that microeconomists just don't focus on. So here's where I, what I wanted to get at. Oh, wait, one, one more comment? Sure. Isn't, isn't competition the name of the game? I mean, uh, when, when there is heavy competition, uh, when there is heavy, heavy competition, like, uh, between different parts of the world, and everybody has internalized in their thinking, and the mindset is, if I increase my salaries, you know, I'm going to uh, either be uncompetitive or I, maybe the option is to send the plant in another country. If, if everybody thinks that, both the uh, company managers and the unions and the people, the fact that you have a couple of uh, IT specialists that you cannot find, or that you have a couple of uh, uh, skilled people that you have shorted off, will not have any impact on, on, the, on the, the, the bulk of it. So I agree with you, but I think, uh, I'm not sure that technology is the, is the reason. I think it's more uh, a global competition which increased, which installed the idea uh, in the mind of everybody, I cannot increase my costs. And I will not increase my cost, period. So here were the two points I was uh, hoping to, I think, emerging from this uh, uh, discussion. We heard, uh, we've heard that the economic outlook, with some exceptions, some relatively modest exceptions, remains a, f a relatively favorable one. And nobody really thinks that that is at any risk short term, save some kind of political, geopolitical disruption. In other words, that the global economy looks like it's going to stay in pretty good shape in the near term. Next, what we've heard is also, or despite that, the uh, continued good growth is not expected to turn into accelerating inflation anytime soon, even in the case of our believer of the Phillips curve, right? Net net result, it is understandable why central bankers, all key central bankers, are either continuing on their course of very accommodative policy or withdrawing it very, very gradually so that policy in the, the stance is still accommodative, even if some of the accommodation is being withdrawn. 
This, of course, has been associated with rising asset prices. So now my question to the panel is, do you think, if anybody wants to comment on this, is this been a mistake in that once again we are, as folks, for example, at the BIS would tell you, we are running risks with financial stability by focusing on focusing monetary policy on uh, on goods and price infl or goods and service inflation and ignoring asset prices once again. Does anybody want to comment, Andre? Yes, I, I think this is the key question. The question is what will be the next financial crisis and when? Of course, when I cannot answer. Uh, if you look at the... <laughs> too bad, too bad, too bad. I, I, we were hoping. I, I wouldn't tell you I'd become rich. <laughs> no, I think we we're almost 10 years now from the subprime crisis, right? And remember, basically, the subprimes uh, was, were, were assets which were relatively high yielding and supposedly liquid. And there was a large amount of them, of those assets, held by banks especially and investors. And at one point, somebody realized that they were not liquid. And they rushed for the door, and that's when the party stops. Now, if you look at the present situation, there is one asset which has grown in to numbers which are amazing, actually several times the amount of subprimes, and that's exchange-traded funds. Now, exchange-traded funds, as you know, I suppose, are a way to invest at, with very, very low cost in either stocks or indices or commodities. But basically, you have to keep in mind that they are usually derivative-based products. In other words, in, in theory, initially, you could, the banks which issue those, or managers who issue these funds, could, could buy the underlying asset and trade the asset. Actually, they don't do that. They do it partly only. They, they buy some assets, and then they buy derivatives. Now, most of those ETFs are supposedly liquid. Now, as you know, there is a move towards passive investment now because it's been proven that it's very difficult for an asset manager to get a better performance than the indices. Uh, Exchange-traded funds, I, the rough number of outstandings today, I think, is roughly four trillion fund, dollars of, of outstandings, trillion. I just read they represent 30% of the trading volume on the US market, equity market. 30% of the trading volume. They're supposed to be liquid, Fund managers love them, uh, and everybody believes that it's liquid. As long as there is no external shock, it's okay. But when there is an external shock, which can be geopolitical, or it can be maybe rates which go up faster than expected, and people rush for the door, that will be the first, I think, one of the first uh, victims. And of course, now, it's, the banks don't have that much amount of those, but fund managers do, and fund managers have to either give the money back to investors, or remember what happened in 2007, in the August of 2007, when BNP Paribas uh, said that one of their money market funds could not be refunded immediately because there was some unliquid securities involved. Now, it took another year before the crisis, but it was the first signal. So I'm worried on that because today everything is fine. There is liquidity. And go back to your question. There is so much money around that there is liquidity, but everybody is looking for yield. And where do you find yield? You find yield in bonds, corporate bonds, not government bonds, but corporate bonds. And you find yield in indices in the stock market. And the cheapest way to buy stocks today, and to trade stocks, is an ETF. So that's my worry. And I know nobody is able to predict how it will happen. Uh, the last time, everybody was wrong. It wasn't what everybody expected. So it may not be this, but it's clear that it's one large risk we have today. Not next month, but in the next year or two. Yeah. Yeah. And, but the, just, to be, just to be clear, 
the source of your worry about potential illiquidity as opposed to simply falling prices is, is well, what? As, as you know, uh, John, liquidity is always the first problem, and then liquidity has the consequences, has insolvency, right? Because if you, if you cannot, you know. Yes. Right. The, in, the case of, in the case of the, CD, the subprimes, subprime actually, the subprime universe was relatively small, but they got subsumed in CDOs. Yes, derivatives based. In derivative, of course. But, Again. But the, but the main problem, the main problem was they were, they were treated as liquid, like you say, from people who didn't actually know, hadn't done the due diligence and didn't know what was in them. So when the subprimes values collapsed, nobody knew what was inside the C, or those, almost no one knew what was inside the CDOs. And since you didn't know what was in the CDOs, you didn't know how to value them, hence the, uh, the problem with the band pay. Uh, for me, uh, I, must, I was at the fund at the time, when Bam Pei Paribas said that, that's when I concluded this was a big, big, big crisis coming. But, um, but also, since I didn't know what was in my portfolio, I didn't know what was in your portfolio, so I was no longer willing to do business with you. On a, right. that's what killed that's what killed liquidity. So that not to not to say yeah, this yeah. is wrong, but with the with the ETFs, it's a slightly different story. It's you know what's you know what's in there. It's different because it's investors, you're right, yeah. rather than banks. But uh, if, it's, if, if it starts, I mean, if, if there is this, okay, then you have a problem of the bond market reacting, the stock market reacting, and that has consequences. Right. right. Indirect consequences. Exactly. Uh, I have a, a similar concern over the functioning of the uh, financial market in general. A uh, few things. First, market making... Uh, capability of uh, security dealers as well as uh, FX dealers have declined significantly because of, uh, you know, Dot Frank and Basel III. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> this is one thing. Second, credit risk taken, taking has also been restrained in the banking sector and pushed to, uh, pushed to shadow banking, as you correctly pointed out. The third point, uh, I also, uh, Andre also mentioned that passive investors, you know, have grown um, during the past decade, and so have index products, and uh, you know, active managers uh, get fewer and fewer, and I'm afraid the dearth of active managers makes the market prone to uh, herd behavior. Um, which could induce runs in the market uh, when a shock is applied to the market. Okay. So, you know, perhaps high frequency trading, um, other machine trading based on a similar algorithm may exacerbate uh, this panic if it happens. Uh, well, in the case of Japanese government bond market, um, BOJ has bought up over 40% of the market and the market has become so thin uh, as to occasion um, squeezes of particular, particular uh, issues uh, at times still. You know. So these are uh, the elements, worrying elements with respect to function of the market in comparison to um, the beginning of the Lehman crisis. Uh, you know, subprime invited uh, a crisis in a very different mechanism. Uh, which you correctly, opaqueness, and uh, you know, everybody lost the confidence in counterparties and survival of your own and the trust in the system. It all crumbled down at the time. But uh, this is a different source we are seeing. Yeah. Par parenthetically, 50% of all the toxic U.S. mortgage assets at the time of the crisis were on European balance sheets. So this, uh, hence why it spread globally so quickly. It was a, a globalized phenomenon. But today you, today you have very large investments in bonds. The banks have bonds, no. Go government and corporate bonds. Okay, that's one thing. The, 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 you mentioned program trading, of course. The, the good news maybe one. One is that it's known. 
And usually the crisis happens on something which is not known or not anticipated, right? So that's one good point. The other one is that markets now have you, how you call the circuit breakers uh, when there is a kind of, of rush. But that doesn't help. It helps for, for, for short term, but it doesn't have a word. So. Exactly. So, uh, Bertrand, go ahead. Uh, if you allow me, you made a good transition with, a, with a, a birthday I'm celebrating in the privacy of my room tonight, which was basically I became group CFO of Credit Agricole the 1st of August 2007. And I had my, my first quarterly. Uh, the def definition of a poison chalice? Correct. <laughs> and I had my first quarterly uh, earnings presentation this moment in November, where basically I moved into disclosing some subprime losses. And I say some because we had just no clue. And, and, and then uh, in December, I was, a, I, mean, I was the first, which actually I don't regret, even if it was a kind of sticker on my back for many years. I was the first to tell, I mean, we, do, we will not replay it, but for some of the people who know, before, remember in 1986 when Chernobyl exploded, there was a thesis that France was the only country not touched by the Chernobyl cloud. And I said, which was not very well said actually, I said, we can, the subprime cloud has hit France as the others, and we must recognize that we have been hit. Which was, uh, and nobody wanted to talk about it. And we were the first to, uh, to do a profit warning on subprime. And to be honest, I remember I went to the board, now it's 10 years ago, I can tell. And the board says, so Bertrand, how much do you want to say? say? I don't know. Several billions. What do you mean, several? Yeah, maybe two, maybe three. And finally, I think we announced three billion in December 07. And the final bill was over five billion for each of the large French banks and the Germans and everybody else. Uh, but that's, that's, that was really a, a very vivid memory, actually. And I think, uh, so, celebrating this birthday tonight in my room, you're invited if you want. But, uh, but it's, it's a good news, I think, and coming back to your point, uh, John, is that we, the preliminary reaction was the right one. I think this is a moment, the international momentum prevented us from repeating the 1930s uh, mistakes. I mean, we have avoided a sharp rise in protectionism, we have avoided austerity measures, and we've done this stimulus, which at a cost, actually, we've seen public debt jumping, but we avoided that. And besides Lehman and a few accidents, the banking system was prevented from totally collapsing. So I think we should celebrate this, and we've survived, and that's, I think, uh, a positive thing. So the point is really, where, where are we now? And I will not speculate on where the next crisis will come from, but my, my analysis, and I've had the, the privilege, if I may say, to be a regulator and a regulator, so I've seen both sides of the equation. And I think uh, today we are at a point where, to a certain extent, we have patched up the system. So we have, I mean, again, and it was probably the right thing to do. So we pushed on monetary policy and we discovered new frontiers of monetary policy. We've pushed on regulatory policy and we discovered new frontiers of, and we've done that year by year. I don't think there was a plan. If you had asked Jean-Claude Fisch in 2008, oh, you will have this quantitative easing forever and, and you will buy unlimited amount. Wow, <laughs> what are you talking about? So, I mean, nobody had this view at that time. And I think we have experimented. And at the end of the day, it's okay because we are still alive. And I don't think we are in a pre-World War III situation. So let, let's be happy of that. But it's, it's, uh, it, it's a problem is that now people are a little bit tired after these 10 years. And I remember I said that with Marcus being here. We, we had this great discussion at the Peterson Institute 10 days ago on rethinking macroeconomics. And, and what, what one of the conclusions I discussed actually after the It was organized by Olivier Blanchard and Larry Summers. I discussed that with Olivier. Is that people want to go back to normal. There is no real willingness to rethink at the end of the day. So we've done all of this when you ask bankers, yes, let's normalize monetary policy. Let's come back to the pre-situation, which is impossible. So my, my point is, so we've patched up the system, we've survived, but we have not a holistic view of how do we finance our economies? We have not addressed that question, which was at the heart of, of Bretton Woods in 1945, at the heart of the reagan Thatcher revolution. We have not addressed that question today. So now we have, uh, I would say, the banks struggling with their profitability. You have the asset managers searching for yield. You have the pension funds, which are running, I mean, growing deficits, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have a system which is struggling to find where it goes. And you have, of course, massive misallocation of capital. I mean, people are buying zero-rate German bonds, which have zero interest for anybody. And they miss the big opportunities elsewhere. So we, we have this, 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 this moment where on top of that, everything is more and more paralyzed by compliance, uh, risk, bureaucracy, I mean, whether it's anti-money laundering, financing of terrorism, you name them. I mean, I'm now starting my own business. I mean, to imagine that to one of my investors who is a very well-known CEO of a 
one of the top 50 companies in the world. It took him three months to be able to give me a check on his personal banking account that I could receive in my bank because he had to send the, the photocopy of the passport of his mother or whatever. It's crazy. So my, my point is, is really we are at a moment where, again, we are alive, but we need to, I mean, to think what, what comes next. How do we address that issue of how do we finance our economy and how do we restore trust in the system? Because at the end of the day, people don't trust the system anymore. I mean, this is part of the, I mean, there are many explanations behind the Brexit, behind Trump, behind whatever. But I think the financial crisis is one of these big issues. If we don't restore trust, that will be part of the next uh, crisis. So I think we should really rethink, and here is a place, and there are many other places, about what do we want to do collectively? And that is a question with the Financial Stability Board. And I remember I said, but what, what is it that we want? And it, interesting, I, just, I mean, uh, I, I cannot quote Mark Carney like this, I'm not his spokesperson, but in, in a way, the point is, it's not our business. We are not here to define a business model. We define the rules, and capitalism will find the business model. I'm not so sure, to be honest. I think it has to be a co-construction. And we are not there at, I don't think we are, we, are, we are there at all. So people think about, I mean, the big objective that we have assigned for the world, be it the sustainable development goals, be it climate and change discussed downstairs, etc. I mean, we need money for that. We need, I mean, we don't need people to put money in Germany. We need people to put money in climate. We need people to put money in health, in agriculture, etc. It's not happening. It's not happening. So people say, oh, yes, great. You have this great revolution of impact investment. Well, that's great. It's, it's very tiny. And I can tell you, the, the minute the U.S. Treasury go back to 5%, I mean, impact will vanish and people will just come back to the whole game. So I think that we are at a moment where we all need to be somewhat smarter. In a way, investors are panicking with zero yield or very low yield. So they need to be to think out of the box. But it's striking because compliance does not allow you to think out of the box. It's very difficult. I mean, the, the, the uh, central banks are, are nervous about the, the monetary policy. Uh, I mean, the government are nervous because they are, except Germany, they are most under fiscal stress. So they don't know what to do with their money. And on top of that, I mean, the multilateral system is also constrained by the Trump position. They will not get any additional money and flexibility. So the system needs to think out of the box and is paralyzed because the system does not allow you to think out of the box. So how can we move this? How can we really coordinate this? For me, this is really uh, the, the, the real question forward. If we want to break this, this misallocation of capital, if you, if you really want to, to work together, and it's very difficult because, as you rightly say, uh, global governance is no longer the name of the game. I mean, you have the Chinese leaders, a new Chinese definition of socialism and the Chinese flavor or whatever. Then you have the Brexit, then you have the, the Trump things, etc. How do we organize these things? I just have no clue. That's why I'm a little bit nervous. If we have another crisis, can we recreate the miracle of 2008, where we prevented the whole world to collapse? I'm not sure we are in a state of mind where we are capable of doing this again. And that's really what worries me. Not so much where and when. But how do we address these things if we are incapable of thinking the system we want to do? So we have been a little bit too long, emotional. No, but you know, no I was just, I, uh, only that I was hoping at the end you were going to give us the solution. <laughs> but no, the solution, again, I, I borrow for, for, from a conference made at the Peterson, actually, from your successor, David Lipton, at this great world. And he says the problem today is that all our cars have a nameplate in Ohio, and we should all uh, move to California. And what did he mean with that? I don't know whether Marcus remembers that conference. He said, Ohio is own house in order. Everybody wants to do his little things at home. And it's not the way forward. The way forward is California, CA, collective action. But it's very challenging. How do we recreate the condition that the US, the EU, China, I mean the BRICS, etc., are capable of working together and not kind of you know, building walls, borders, distrust, etc. And that's really what worries me. Yes, although I, I agree that the problem we have, I think one of the problems is, uh, especially I would say in the financial system, if we don't know where we're going, then any road will do. So it's what we've, what we've, what we've evolved is a regulatory reform that said, this bad thing happened, we're going to make sure it never happens again. That bad thing happens, we're going to make sure it never happens again. But if you say, what is the system, what do we want the system to look like when we're done, the answer is, and, and what would the regulatory environment uh, structures look like to make that happen, there's, there is no answer to that. Daniel, oh wait, you've been, you've been waiting and then, then we'll come to you. Yeah, go right ahead. I would like to go back to your original question about monetary policy and its impact on uh, 
asset assets and uh, asset inflation as well as the good and prices of goods and and services. Uh, and then how can you finance an economy? I'll go back to Bertrand's uh, issue. Before that, I would like to give a short expose about, uh, to tell you that Lebanon had not actually uh, suffered from the global financial crisis. As a matter of fact, uh, Christian Noyer, the governor of Banque de France, came to Lebanon a year later, in 2010, I think. And he said, I just came here to see and learn what you guys have done so that you were able to weather the global financial crisis. What we have done, we have actually done lots of preemptive uh, policies, preemptive measures that prevented that from happening. We don't have a subprime. As a matter of fact, we have banned derivatives. We don't have derivatives in, in, our, in our country. So this is why the, uh, that during that period, Lebanon has witnessed a growth of 8 to 10 percent, 2008 and 9 and 10. We had that kind of a growth over that time. And as a matter of fact, for the first time in the history of Lebanon, we have witnessed an influx of deposits by 24 percent uh, during that time. That never happened again. Usually, it's, uh, it's not that much. Now, what the central bank did do to, uh, uh, to actually stimulate the economy and at the same time make sure that the, it's not impacted the inflationary. Uh, we have targeted our inflation at the same time. Uh, we didn't, uh, uh, we, we had, let me go back to in, in my statement. Uh, we have, and back in 2013, we have come up with a policy which we call a stimulus package, whereby we lend banks one billion dollars, and we've been doing that since. We gave them one billion dollars at 1% interest rate, so that's their cost of fund. They, in turn, would pass it on to the consumers. And f although banks now, as we speak, and go into the fuel in the economy, banks have 20 billion dollars right now ready to be used. And if they use the 20 billion dollars out of the 200 billion dollars in, in our economy, which is, by the way, Lebanon's economy is 52 billion dollars. We're not talking about a big economy. But when we say that we have deposit base in our banks of uh, almost four times our, our GDP, that's a lot. 20 billion dollars are available, but those are not cheap funds. They cannot, they have to bring them up in the PPP, private public partnerships and other, other, series, uh, other uh, uses. So that had stimulated the economy and we were able to, part of this package, 50% of this package went to the real estate development because we had determined at that time that real estate is a, actually can trail along with it 20 to 30 businesses and, and professions along with it. So this way, we have lots of real estate developments, and, but, anyway, but th things have changed. While they were in larger sizes before, now they go, went to the, what the market has needed. So we have done that. We have $20 billion available at, in, in, a, in an economy of, of, of $54 billion now. We have stimulated the economy, and the central bank stimulus package has contributed to 50% of the GDP growth since 2013 with no fail every single year, and we were able to quantify that. And we have targeted some economies, the knowledge economy, the uh, research and development, real estate, education, anything that has to do with technology. Thank you.